Good morning. This is Mark de Sonnerhounds. I'm one of the co-founders of the Institute for Real Growth, and I want to welcome you to this uh, Humanizing Growth series. Over the next weeks, every Friday at the same time, in your morning, if you're in the in Americas, in your afternoon, early afternoon if you're in Europe, or in your evening if you're in Asia. Um, we will be having discussions with uh, fellow growth leaders, discussing what it takes to win in driving humanized growth strategy. Over the next few weeks, um, I'll be talking, as well as Frank van den Driest, my uh, fellow co-founder of the Institute, will be talking to leaders like Paul Pullman, Antonio Lucio, Mark Reed, Miguel Patricio, and many, many more. Uh, and they are from the world of business, from the world of what it takes to drive humanized growth. Uh, I see there are many new faces uh, on the attendee list. So I will spend uh, less than a minute introducing the Institute for Real Growth. We were founded just over a year ago as an independent and not-for-profit institute focused solely on helping CMOs and other senior growth leaders drive humanized growth by connecting them to expertise, research, benchmarking, uh, but most importantly, probably to their peers around the themes of what it takes to win. I said we were independent, but we have big supporters. Um, the Institute for Real Growth is supported by WPP, by Kantar, by Oxford University and New York University, the Side Business School at Oxford, I should say, the Exeter Group, and Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, and last but certainly not least, Spencer Stewart. And that's why it's very special today that I actually can uh, welcome an old friend, Greg Welsh from Spencer Stewart, who is here uh, to talk with me over this next hour around um, the role of the CMO as a growth leader and the theme of humanized growth in marketing today and in our surreal reality of the post-COVID world. Uh, Greg, welcome to this Humanized Growth series. Uh, how are you and where are you? Well, I'm, uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'm, Greg, humbled to, to I'm humbled to uh, think about the amazing group of speakers that you have uh, coming on. So thrilled to be with you. Um, this is a new way oh, of Greg, engaging. I can't hear you. Ah, I know why now. <laughs> I, I know why. I, I, I went on mute. Sorry, please. No worries. No worries. I, I'm often muted. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm humbled as I heard you talk about the other speakers that you'll have in the coming months. Uh, thanks to you for pulling this together and the great work at IRG. Uh, I'm actually coming to you from Venice, Florida today, which is just south of Sarasota. Uh, my family and I moved here uh, five, six months ago. And uh, although the weather is nice, uh, we try to get outside a little bit. Like everybody else, uh, this has been a surreal uh, situation in time that none of us will ever forget. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm calling in from uh, upstate New York, Woodstock to be precise, two hours north of New York. And um, we are here in, um, in nature and it's uh, surreal to think what well, just two hours south of here is happening in the, the big new Apple, the New York City uh, we love and where we've met so often. Uh, let me introduce you properly to uh, everyone listening in. Uh, we have uh, over 90 participants uh, on the call uh, from all over industry, from all over the world. Many of them are participants in the Institute for Real Growth uh, Leadership Program, and, um, and uh, they have not met you. So a, a proper introduction. So Greg is uh, from Spencer Stewart, as I mentioned, but he isn't just from Spencer Stewart. He actually leads the marketing, sales officer, and communication officer practices globally. It's a role that he took on last year, but actually within Spencer Stewart, he's been championing the CMO, which for uh, over a decade as a leader. And um, he is um, uh, not just a market leader in CMO searches, but he's also done a ton of board and CEO searches, which I think is relevant for this conversation. More than 20 years of experience, more than 600 senior placements. And I know that you're always very careful um, around um, um, uh, confidentiality, of course. But I think I can mention after the fact that you've placed uh, the big uh, marketers, the CMOs at Facebook, at Target, Beam Santori, Hershey, stop me if I'm wrong, CVS, Aetna, Allstate, and at Fitness. Uh, that's that's a, a, a very impressive list. But I think 
most importantly for today, you're also the co-author already five years ago of the book Good for Business, The Rise of the Conscious Corporation. Uh, Corporation. And, and, and this was a very early initiative where I think you were in many ways a bellwether for many of the themes that we're going to be discussing today and that are becoming mainstream now. Uh, Greg's been published in Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Advertising Age. Um, and what's interesting is if there is a CMO gathering somewhere in the world, uh, you held up your cup and I noticed the 50 logo on that cup. I have the same cup. I wasn't there. Greg, Greg is always there. So at the Marketing 50, the CMO Council, the ANA CMO uh, Board, uh, Greg is there because uh, it takes a village and um, he is a, a marketer at heart. Now, um, I think he's probably actually uh, one of the most connected, if not the most connected person worldwide with CMOs globally. So Greg, there's a long history of work around CMOs. Is it just because that became your specialization? Or is there more to it? You know, I actually, thanks, Mark, for all that. Uh, I was actually hired into the firm 20 plus years ago with the notion of building out the sales function. And ironically, as I got into it, for every sales search I would do, I would do three or four marketing searches. And so I, I got lucky, I suppose, and kind of backed into it. I suppose it's not surprising when you think about a sales organization with a pyramid of lots of talented people that move their way up and get promoted more likely that a sales leader might come from within, which of course makes great sense. Uh, and over the years, I've just been motivated by the marketing function. The idea to get somebody to buy something or have an idea that they might not otherwise has always intrigued me from a psychological perspective. And I'm a bit of a recovery marketer myself, having done some work at Colgate and Nabisco and others. And so I, 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 I love the function and Yes, I see you and all my friends at uh, shows and conferences around the world. And the truth of the matter is, I love the people I'm with. Uh, this is a people business. Uh, these are my friends. Uh, I'd like to think that we can build some great careers together. And uh, I perhaps may have the best job on the planet. So I'm uh, uh, pretty enthusiastic about what we do and, and the impact we get to have on people's lives and their companies. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, I think that's very true for um, Frank and I, too. Uh, we started Effective Brands almost to the day 20 years ago. And uh, Effective Brands was focused on global brand leaders, as you may remember. Uh, the head of Dove globally was the first uh, client, Silvia Lagnado, who's now the CMO at uh, Natura. And uh, many of those people have uh, moved into CMO roles already over the last decade. Uh, we really were only working with CMOs and it became our club. And uh, when we did Marketing 2020 together, with you and Spencer Stewart, which is now five years ago, um, that um, really cemented the relationship. But it's, um, you know, we weren't planning to go here as part of the Humanized Growth um, series, Greg, but before we get into that theme, you know, the world is um, um, crashing uh, down around us. And, um, and, and, and there will be people on this call uh, that have been furloughed or that are furloughing their teams uh, that are uh, suddenly in a very different situation than before. So before we let go of the, the headhunter focus or executive search, as I, I, I know is the official uh, description, can you talk a little bit about um, what a search process for a CMO typically looks like? Great. Um, well, every, every process is a little bit different, but at a, at a high level, and I'm happy to dig down if the listeners are interested. So in a typical mandate, it starts with a phone call that I get from the CEO or a CHRO. Uh, and the, the list of, of reasons why they may make a call vary. Um, in a good news story, somebody gets promoted and has moved on or gone up in the organization. But in many cases, CEOs tell me, I just need something slightly different. And this is a theme that we hear, and Mark will circle back to if it makes sense. But uh, typically what we'll do after we do an environmental where we learn all we can about the company. We try to think about where they're headed so we can look around corners on what are the skills that they might need going forward. If there were any missteps in the past, it's important that we understand those. We do a market diagnostic to understand the competitive landscape. And out of that, I've got a super smart group of people behind me, as you know and would expect, that begin to evaluate the marketplace. Who are the players in those categories that are performing well? which companies and leaders out there have made their brands rise to the top. 
who are the people that peers and subordinates are talking about as a person that's got a charismatic personality that's doing great things that gets the best out of a team. And we begin to compile a list of people, as you would expect. And it's done on a very fact-based way. On a typical search, I would say we probably look somewhere between 120 and maybe 150 uh, profiles. Uh, these would be people, some of whom we know really well, uh, some of whom we'd like to get to know better, and others whom are recommended for the process. So we try to avoid the temptation on the front end to call the people that I think would be great for the search, although I do that as well. Uh, but through a pretty rigorous uh, research project, we'll look at, you know, call it north of 100 people. Over the course of a search, we'll probably talk to 60 or 80 in person to have a conversation. We can't assume that everybody's interested in the search, and we certainly won't assume that everybody's qualified for the search. Mm -hmm. uh, so I spend a lot of my days delivering bad news about why someone may not be quite right for what we're looking for. Uh, I'll probably in an average search meet 20 people. Oftentimes it's now like this via video. Uh, we do background checks on those people. Uh, we try to figure out how they fit. And Mark, as you would expect in every search, nobody's perfect. Nobody's gonna stack up perfectly against the criteria. And during this process, I'm also spending my time and our team is spending a lot of time with the CEO to make sure their expectations are appropriate. What the market will yield, what it's gonna require uh, from an obscure location or financially what it's gonna cost or who they can get. And part of my job ironically is to make, it, make sure it doesn't turn into a popularity contest. I try to help the client get through a formal vetting where they're asking the right questions and they're picking the person that's the best fit for the team culturally but brings the right skills. And so in most cases, that funnel goes from 150 people to 30. Uh, ideally, we'll have them meet four or five candidates. And, and if we do it right, uh, two or three emerge as finalists, and then hopefully the client has a difficult decision to make. So it's a, on, on average, call it a 15 to 20 week process, typically, uh, for a lot of reasons that we can talk about. Um, Lots of, of interaction, uh, making sure you're being transparent with candidates along the way, helping the client make a good decision. And, you know, I will tell you where my, my partners and I at Spencer Stewart have the best situations. It's where we're with the client in the end, helping them to pick the solution. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is there could be a couple of people that might be great solutions. Of course, our mission is to help them find the very best fit. You know, I, I read somewhere else in an interview with you that um, you said that a lot of the conversations you have are bad news conversations. Uh, and of course, the pride, I, you know, I, I listed some of the huge successes of people. Uh, you know, these are the, highest, the most high profile marketers in the world that you've placed. Um, uh, what, what's what, what's the diff most difficult thing about this for you? Yeah, you know, it's um, I, I suppose from afar, uh, people might look at me and or our firm and people and say, "Wow, they're working on all these amazing searches for great yeah, clients." Exactly. Yeah. You know what? It, it's it's really hard work what we do, and I've been doing this 21 years now. I don't get it right all the time, and I make mistakes daily. Mm -hmm. And my colleagues, uh, friendly in you know, a gentle way, remind me of it at times, and, and we're <laughs> continually getting better. What I have learned over the years, and I learned this from my father, was the power of saying no. And in this world where we get caught up of trying to please everyone, uh, I think there's been a tendency in years, at least my perspective, where it gets away from us and we maybe don't always act as the truth tellers as we should. And I actually keep a file of letters I've gotten over the years where I've delivered bad news to candidates. Like, you know, Mark, that interview didn't go well, you didn't handle it right. Uh, your references don't suggest that you do what you said you did here. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I want to tell you that I want to be candid with you so that you and I can work together down the road. And interestingly, of all the letters I get from people, the ones where I've delivered bad news and they basically said, thank you, Greg. Thanks for being a truth teller. Thanks for uh, being honest with me and candid about it. And we're all in this, uh, you know, I'm a, a try to be a humble guy and, and uh, everything may look great at what we do. I mean, I've got family struggles. Uh, I've got pressure. I work super hard. Uh, I've got clients that aren't always entirely happy and everything. All this happens and we're all in this together. I just think we're better together, which is part of why I love what IRG and some of these other marketing communities are doing to come together. 
Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's very uh, relevant. And you you mentioned marketing communities. Uh, as you said that, I realized that I I haven't really explained for the many people that are listening to our conversation, watching this conversation, what this leadership program uh, entails that the Institute for Real Growth. Um, uh, runs and it's worthy of mention. Um, so about a hundred, a hundred and five chief marketing officers and uh, heads of uh, of businesses, basically um, ranging from um, the CMO of a five billion dollar company or the uh, P and L leader of a seven billion dollar um, uh, baby division, for example, uh, are all uh, doing this um, IRG Real Growth Program. And in cohorts of about 20, uh, there's one in Shanghai, there's two uh, in conjunction with uh, NYU in New York, and there's two in conjunction with uh, the University of Oxford Site Business School, obviously in Oxford. Um, these um, people come together uh, three times for two days. Now, of course, this is all online until uh, the foreseeable future. But they come together around the key themes that the Institute for Real Growth Research has found are important in driving humanized growth, are important in driving growth over performance, over a sustained time. And um, we have a, a, a clear curriculum. There's real expertise and, and research findings and best practices that we bring in to discuss, but the great value is then in the, the people actually discussing those in small groups together and, and, and making them personal saying, you know, I've done this and what I found it works for me is A, B and C. Or in fact, in contrast, um, I keep running into a wall on this aspect of D. And, um, and, and many of those components are around what is my role in the organization? So I want to start zooming into that uh, um, in this conversation break, um, starting with the outside world. Look, I mean, little did we know when we first discussed uh, working together on this uh, program together, that um, that we would be uh, uh, zooming in from so many places in the world and not actually being able to shake each other's hand. Uh, so much has changed. Um, as you look at it, as a executive uh, recruiter, a search firm, uh, looking at your clients, how has the world for business before COVID even? We'll get to the what are the COVID implications because. Uh, I don't think anybody would claim to understand that yet, but I'd like to go there later. But just before we get to COVID, just if you look at the last decade or so uh, and, and, and the big things that have changed for businesses, before we zoom into the implications for a CMO role, what, what are the big changes that you've seen for business? Well, it's funny, you know, when I think back, Mark, about my career, I actually made a big bet that marketers would become CEOs. And my secret hidden agenda was that my friends like you that were terrific marketers would become heads of companies. And the fact of the matter is that's not playing out the way I guessed it would. No. Now, again, this is not a, a mark against this incredible talent. Um, there are amazing marketers and many, when I look at the restaurant world or I look at CPG, many of those P&L marketing leaders are running the companies. Uh, but it's not playing out exactly the way I would have guessed. The fact of the matter is um, that leadership tomorrow continues to change. Uh, when I think about uh, the power of the consumer above all, and this is why I have great hope that marketing will continue to become critically important or more and more important. The voice of the consumer with loud mouthpieces, with bullhorns in some situations, chiming in on brands is not something we had happening 10 years ago. And it has changed our game in an enormous way. And perhaps if we have time, we can talk about how the marketing function has gone from what I call poetry, which is creative artistic marketing to plumbers, which is uh, data centric types. Oh yes, I wanna get uh, into this. There's been a massive shift. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're gonna look for people that can do some of both. And I suspect we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but it is a, uh, complex world. I mean, you know, well, you know, there are, it's not uncommon for me to have a marketing friend who's got two or 3000 people on his or her teams uh, across multifunctions, the CMO job, I call it CMO plus continues to expand. And we could talk about some of the things we're seeing there. I, I actually continue to believe and I'm an optimist, as you know, uh, I think it's an exciting time to be in marketing. These jobs are tough and I applaud, you know, groups like IRG that are helping marketers improve their skill sets. Right. Well, um, 
Okay, so let's let's zoom in then a little bit on on that marketer uh, and, and CMO role. Um, what is it that, uh, as you see, I mean, perhaps it would be useful for people to hear also a little bit about the themes that you raised in your book, uh, because I said that you were a little bit like the uh, canary in the mine. Um, you uh, you raised some key themes there that also in the Institute for Real Growth Leadership Program. Uh, have become central themes, but we're five years down the line from you. Uh, perhaps you could talk a little bit about what led you to, to write the book and, uh, and, and the themes that you mentioned there. You know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of ironic. It was almost 10 years ago, actually. Andrew Bennett, a friend of mine who at the time was running Havas, he's the CEO of Hart Hanks now, called and said, Greg, I got this idea that the market around us is changing in a dramatic way. Um, we need to write about it. And he, he had hoped that the perspective that I gained at Spencer Stewart would be relevant to the listeners. The fact of the matter is, um, I don't know, I don't want to be naive, but I don't believe 10, 15 years ago, people were making purchase decisions about their washing machine or their automobile or their stereo based on other criteria about the company, whether it be their stance on sustainability, whether it's their CEO's compensation, their carbon footprint, how they treat their employees. And all I know is we began to see this, and you've put a magnifying glass on this in the last couple of years with your work. Uh, the fact of the matter is it was changing. Uh, Andrew and I and a couple of others got together and said, let's talk about this. Um, I do think it was early work, uh, and no doubt we're seeing it play, off, play, play out now, and the humanization of brands is something that is – absolutely incredible today and, and a major part of what every marketer is thinking about. Well, what I liked a lot, uh, thank you for that. Um, as I said, I thought there were many bellwether themes that you identified there. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about uh, putting humans first, uh, living um, the, 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 the business and uh, the brand purpose and thinking about how you can help. These sound like incredibly uh, important uh, themes um, today and for tomorrow, uh, but it's a it's a rallying cry which actually led to the name of this series, the Humanizing uh, Growth series. Um, you know, I think, and, and this is an Institute for Real Growth, um, if you like, um, rallying cry. Um, we see that this has become a movement. I mean, there are uh, people and voices that have been talking about this for a long time, all the way from Bill Gates uh, coming to Davos uh, over a decade ago and talking about conscious capitalism. Um, and, and, and there are many leaders in business that know what the right thing to do is and that want to do the right thing. But there was always that argument, uh, they won't let me do that. Uh, whether it was the CFO wouldn't let me, if it was the CMO talking, or, or if it was the CEO talking, saying, look, my shareholders won't let me do this. I, if I do this alone, my company will stand out with higher costs uh, if I start doing things in a more responsible manner, um, in a more humanized manner, um, uh, and, and therefore I can't. But we now do see a, 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 what we would call a movement change. I mean, if I just line up what has happened just over the last 18 months, you've got, you know, Larry Fink's, the, the CEO of BlackRock, uh, writing that letter to all the major CEOs in the world. So many of the CMOs that you and I know have talked to me about their CEO coming in with a letter and saying, well, we have to address this. And, and, and him basically saying, look, of course I'm interested in your financial results, but if you present a strategy that doesn't explicitly explain how your business is going to create value for the other stakeholders of this corporation, we call them the four C's, yes, the capital markets, but then the community, the colleagues, and of course the customer. If I don't see a strategy for how you're gonna create value for those other stakeholders also, I'm not gonna invest in your company. And then just you know, right on the back of that, I think that was probably licensed for many CEOs to say, okay, if you're asking for it, I'll give it to you. And the, the business round table in the US you know, 200 top CEOs uh, declared after 30 years, their purpose for the corporation had been completely, um, I think it was Milton Friedman based, you know, make a profit, don't break the law, but focus on profit. And now they've changed it to a real multi-stakeholder, what we would call humanized growth perspectives, where they recognize the, the importance of the company to create value 
for all of those leaders, for all of those stakeholders, I mean. And then just most recently, little did we know, uh, post-COVID in Davos, where, and all credit to Davos, they've been saying this for a long time, but they restated that sort of um, uh, reneging on the shareholder primacy and saying, no, we're here as a company for all stakeholders. I mean, uh, that's clearly a movement. And those CEOs signed that declaration. Um, but, you know, wh what do you think is the impact of that? And do you see that movement too now? Well, you know, one of the, the tenets of what I would have, I've watched for many, many years uh, of great leaders is courage. And whether you agree with Larry Fink's comment or whether you agree with bold moves that Nike or Burger King or pick a company have done, uh, I personally love it. Uh, you know, I, I'm super intrigued by his move. And in this case, and I don't remember the number, I think it's like $7 trillion that BlackRock has. And they've now made a vow of, I think, a quarter. If, if a quarter of your profits are derived from thermal coal, we're out. Yeah. And the ripple effects of that bold statement, and you are absolutely right that CEOs across the world had it on their front on the top of their desks and their comms department and their investors were asking, what are you going to do? And, and this is clearly a tipping point. And, and again, this is part of why I, I, I love what we do. I'm intrigued by how companies are going to respond. Um, and I think it's right at the center of what you've been talking about. And if you haven't prepared your brand to be human, authentic, transparent, and for, at, for Pete's sake to stand for something, why do you need to exist? And I love that marketers are doing a really honest self-assessment with their CEOs to say, why do we deserve to live here? What's going to be unique about us? And how are we going to deliver this message? And how are we going to show up? And it's changing everything. I mean, for my world, it's, it's creating, uh, you know, madness in some cases. But I, I'm really proud of many of our client companies that are stepping up and, and quite frankly, doing the right things. But it's going to cause massive, massive ripple effects and uh, – this is the new day that we're in right now, for sure. Well, you know, what What I find so interesting about that is you've got these 200, let's stick with the, the American group. And, now, and in fact, America's probably lagging Europe and uh, every part of the world is in a different phase. We're gonna to talk to uh, Patrick Su, the uh, CEO of uh, WPP uh, China next week. Uh, my colleague, Frank Vandendries will be uh, having a conversation with him um, same time next week. Uh, and I, I want to just point out that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to, um, to add questions that you have for, for Greg or myself or that you would think uh, take the discussion uh, in a direction that you wanted to see it go. Um, but, you know, that movement, that, uh, that sea of change, uh, in many ways, I think, you know, the big changes in the world, and again, we're talking in a very special moment, they happen because movements were created and there's a tipping point. I think you used the term just now. Uh, so here's these 200 CEOs that have signed this business roundtable declaration. My guess is half of them are going back to the Ford and thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to coordinate my stakeholder value creation process? How do I even understand the needs of these other stakeholders that are apparently important. Uh, how am I going to translate that to value? How do I make sure it's coherent? And they're going to be looking around their boardroom going, and who's going to help me do this? Am I going to coordinate all this? Or is there someone, and this is a leading question, what do you think are the implications for the CMO role when that question is on the CEO's mind? Yeah, I, I can't, you know, again, I can't imagine a better time. There's incredible pressure in these jobs. But great marketers are the ones that have the platform, have the ideas, understand what consumers are saying about their brand, understanding the competitive landscape, and understanding where our brand can travel. And, you know, it, I can't imagine a better time than right now to do that. You know, and, and admittedly, in a time where a CMO is in the chair for 44, 45 months on average, you got to move quickly. Uh, I think in most cases, you think of yourself as a caretaker for this chapter of the history of the company or the brand. You know, what I would like to think is that the marketers that I know that are doing it well are thinking about how do I plant seeds today such that we'll be resilient and thriving down the road. And it's not unlike what's happened right now, Mark, in, with COVID. Uh, it, here in the U.S., as you know, uh, Wall Street will likely give many CEOs a hall pass. 
Exactly. Whether your business is down 40% or 60%, who uh, knows the difference? All are tragic, <laughs> and the reality is going to happen. You know what they're caring about is what's your plan to come out? Exactly. What are you going to look like? How are you going to modify what you're doing today? And it's my hope, and I know in many cases that powerful, courageous CMOs are at the side of the CEO saying, here's what we can do, here's how we win. And we're already beginning to see some of that happen right now, which is exciting. Well, you know, so uh, the conversations that happen in the Real Leadership Growth uh, Program uh, are confidential. People are in cohorts of 20, but then during the meetings, now also in these breakout rooms, they meet in groups of four or five, and those are confidential uh, discussions. But we always regroup. And over the last uh, few weeks, we've had uh, almost all of the participants actually weigh, on, weigh in on the role of the CMO now, at this time. Um, and one of the key themes that we're hearing back is, one, at the moment, the CMO is not in the driver's seat. Over the last few weeks, it's been operations, it's been finance, cash flow, and interestingly, it's been HR, because we need to take care of our colleagues. We need to think about their well-being, and we need to manage our, our, our resources and make sure that we have the team to come out of this. Um, but what we've also heard across the board is that CMOs are saying, if at any time it was easy to start a conversation about the importance of humanized growth, the importance of all those other stakeholders. Think about what companies are thinking about now. It's about what impact do we have on the community? How are we helping the community? How we're taking care of our people? Um, it's now. And so there will be a time really soon, as you say, where the company is going to, as Paul Pullman said in the, our discussions to prepare for this, he said, if a company business looks the same post COVID versus pre COVID, there's something fundamentally wrong. So how is that going to look different? So, I mean, what do you directly think the implications are for the, for the CMO role? And who do you think is doing this well? Yeah, you know, it's funny, it's funny. I, um, as you would expect, and I know you've been pulled into many of these as well, the marketing community came together. You know, one of the silver linings in all this is that I have seen this group come together and sharing of best practices and ideas. And the conversation of the last four or five weeks has evolved from, do we speak? Should we go quiet? Uh, I'm worried about the, the, will my company survive? I'm worried about having to furlough 50% of my team to how do we want to show up? And when I look back and, and uh, see what's happening behind the scenes at, at the way Rick Gomez at Target is handling things, the way they're being empathetic for their guests, Norm DeGraff's doing the same thing at CVS. Yeah. Uh, my friend and schoolmate, Mark Cuban, you may have seen uh, with the Mavericks. Uh, no, I didn't see it, no. Decided to do a deal where all of his employees, uh, if they have lunch at local restaurants, he'll reimburse them during this time off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're seeing Microsoft paying all the hourly workers uh, that take care of the campus even when they're not there. We're seeing companies like AB InBev begin to uh, transform their manufacturing into producing hand sanitizer. So we're seeing this, do we make donations? Do we commit to our employees that we're going to do the right thing? And, and the good news in all of this is I have seen a unity and a coming together in what has recently been a quite divided country. And my hope is that these random acts of kindness and things that are going on will continue post COVID. Uh, but there are some, some elements of this. And I will also just tell you from a, um, many people sitting at home, I got to tell you, I'm embarrassed a little bit. I feel like I know more about my own team's, children, dogs. Um, a moment ago, I had to hit mute. You guys will laugh. I'm, of course, not at Spencer Street. That's a bad screen behind me. But um, my daughter was apparently making a smoothie, and I heard this loud blender in the background. <laughs> that, yes. I said, you please be quiet. You know, uh, uh, so this is, this is the new normal of what we're dealing with, and, and yeah. I'm in it with you. Uh, mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is I think people are, are spending time and being more sympathetic and empathetic. You know, I, I think the latest I heard, there were some, you know, two over two million people infected and there's been 140,000 deaths um you know can't quite get my hands around how we all cope and deal with this but again i do think we're better together and uh and and i'm, I'm looking at the bright side of this i'm making lemonade and uh, i'm getting to know my team and many of my candidates and clients better than i ever have before you know it's so true and um 
I, I, I was thinking yesterday, I was speaking to the CEO of uh, one of these um, companies, um, uh, Convene. Uh, they are a WeWork uh, competitor, uh, joint spaces, events, and their business uh, massively impacted. And he was just going through all the initiatives that, uh, that they're undertaking. And at the same time, his three or four year old son was hitting him from the side. First, he was able to keep it out of view and suddenly, and it made me think of what, you know, the, the video that rightly uh, on YouTube deserves to be one of the favorites uh, ever of that BBC correspondent in Hong Kong whose kids and ultimately Nanny come crashing into his room. Uh, you, know, you, you know what? I uh, uh, Don't be surprised if you see one of my kids run in here, even though there's a sign on the door that says, please don't come in and be quiet. I mean, it's this is what we're dealing with. Uh, we're all humans. We're making the best of it. And. And I've seen more pictures of bedrooms and bad closets. And I mean, this is, it's just the new normal of what we're gonna have to deal with. And it's, it's all okay. And we are gonna get through this, but it's, it's, there's gonna be some bumps along the way. Uh, absolutely. The, the way I managed to prevent that this time, uh, my biggest fan, my daughter, um, instead of her walking into the room, I just gave her a log on. She's watching the screen right now. <laughs> so I know that she won't be walking in. And I hope that is not meant as a provocation. Hey, let's zoom in a little bit. We're, um, we're just over halfway. And I want to zoom in more on what has already been alluded to, um, the CMO role moving forward. The CMO role as a growth role. And a um, little bit of history here from an IRG perspective. Uh, and I'd love your take on this too. Um, what we see is that over the last, um, let's say 20, 15 years or so, um, there's been a real shift where um, as the internet and then data, data analytics uh, came up, uh, I think there was a huge swing within the marketing discipline to embrace that. Um, and uh, what we hear from the over 550 interviews we did worldwide with uh, CEOs and other CMO peers uh, is that um, it's very clear that marketing jumped on that. Uh, people have pointed out to me, it's probably because we're marketers and we like new shiny toys. Um, we are the part of the company that's always focused on innovation and new things, new ideas. So it's probably inherent in the CMO marketer profile that we kind of like that kind of thing. At the same time, there's been pressure from all directions that marketing should embrace uh, digital, uh, perhaps to levels that are actually unhealthy. Um, I explain that because there is, um, on the one hand, the perennial chip on every marketer's shoulder that in the past, uh, like Monomaker said, we don't know which half of our spend was wasted versus effect. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I've heard stories of CMOs of big industrial companies being admonished in boardroom meetings by board members that said, why don't we have the same number of likes as Coca-Cola? Well, we're not a consumer facing company. And so um, we see that there has been a huge shift towards the, uh, what I would call how to win in uh, the new marketing reality. Many things have changed. The, the partners have changed. The agencies have changed. The metrics have changed. And of course, the fundamentals haven't. And, and what a lot of the peers of marketers are saying is that um, if a CMO in, a, in an exco, in an executive committee, is meant to be focusing on both how to win, of course, which is all about the tactical marketing, but also the where to play. You know, where are we going as a business? Where's the white space? Where are the opportunity uh, pockets? that that is probably the part where marketers usually partner with their colleagues, with strategy, with the CFO, with sales, with the CEO, and actually they haven't shown up sufficiently in that area as they were learning this new world. And so um, as we talk about the role moving forward, we see uh, an opportunity for some course correction uh, and to bring that back. Now, I really want to grab onto something that you can take credit for, for naming um, this, this, this concept of the Da Vinci growth CMO, the Da Vinci uh, mindset of a CMO. Tell me a little bit about what you mean with that. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate because we then uh, collaborated to develop that profile together. But tell me how that thinking came about and what you 
think about when you talk about yeah, the no, ha happy to real quickly on the on the title piece there's been a lot said about the evolution of the cmo title and it seems to be vogue currently to be a chief growth officer chief customer yes. officer, what have you yes. i actually don't care uh in any regard i i often though as you would expect sit with marketers and say tell me about the five most important things you're doing right now kind of a standard fare and you might think about how you might answer that question and Shockingly, Mark, there are times where many of the initiatives that are top five don't drive growth inherently. And I often find conversely with those CMOs that seem to have it all going on, they're focused on doing some things that may enhance the brand, but are very much tied to driving new revenue, new products, what have you. So that's important. The, the Da Vinci piece, uh, kind, of a, kind of a fun story. So I think you've probably heard me talk about poets and plumbers and where are you on that spectrum? And to your credit, you were hosting a meeting in Cannes last year. Sadly, we won't see you there this year. And it was an early breakfast meeting down in some bad tent, but on the beach, thank you. And uh, as we were talking about all of these skills that we need for tomorrow, and I always try to think of it about if I'm a young emerging wannabe CMO, what's, what skills do I need to possess what attributes do I need to demonstrate and what do I want people to say about me? And as you know, and I think you've since published this to your members, it's a quite exhaustive list. And as a young person or even as an older guy now, I look at it and say, boy, that's, I'm kind of exhausted yeah. thinking about all these things. And as we were talking about all the key attributes that are, of course are important, which is a good kind of a guiding light, I think true knows for, for any marketer, I popped out of the, your, your, uh, your meeting, walked up the steps, and sure enough, and I was in the midst of reading the Leonardo da Vinci book by Walter Isaacson. If you haven't read it, everybody should. It's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I look up and I see the da Vinci restaurant right in front of me on the, on the plaza. And it was at that moment that I started to think about, let's think about Leonardo. And what I didn't know until I got into the book uh, is what a prolific inventor he was that he was building waterway systems. Um, you know, of course, we knew him as the one that did the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa. He was an artist, an amazing sculptor. But this guy was an engineer. He was an inventor. He was an architect. And he had both levels of it. And I think perhaps an analog for marketers to be thinking about today is, and it's somewhat gross in the book that you may recall, is he was interested in what was under the skin as he began to both model, sculpt, and paint human bodies and he was very into the human body. Muscles, the nerves. He did some pretty uh, uh, borderline sick uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, surgeries to understand post-ops on corpses to understand what was under the structure. And I think the analogy for us, that if I could take it up about 30,000 feet, it's what's going on under the under the ground? What, what really is stirring in consumers' hearts? What unmet needs might there be? And so I, you know, I'm constantly encouraging people to have this combination and balance where you can of uh, artistic magic in the creative that we all love to talk about and showcase with the performance marketing and science and data, which is clearly swung, that pendulum has swung over the last handful of years. And I don't have many original thoughts, but I often study, I've made my life of this, study those that really do it well. And those that are doing it well look more Da Vinci-like. They're in the middle and they've got this combination of both they're first and foremost leaders. You know, when I th think about who's doing it well, like, you know, my friends at Facebook, I think both Antonio Lucci, who I'm thrilled to hear, I didn't know he was going to be one of your speakers and yes, no, he was some, uh, doing some amazing things there. Uh, there are some companies that are really approaching it in a humane way, being authentic, uh, quite frankly, making sure their teams look like their consumer population and doing what's right from a diversity standpoint. So the, the good news is there's some great work going on behind the scenes, and it's been fun to use Da Vinci as an analog, if you will. Uh, there's many, many attributes there. You know, I'm trying to pick my favorite. It's a little like trying to pick my favorite child, um, not the one that was with the blender a moment ago, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff in there to unpack. <laughs> well, you know, so, so a few things uh, sort of so very serendipitously came together because the, um, when the, um, the Institute for Real Growth led the growth study now over a year ago, um, it, it identified the seven building blocks of real growth. Uh, and, and one of those was whole brain. 
which really goes to this point. I mean, it really talked about, you know, I think there are probably very, very few people, I only know a few, and I certainly don't count myself among them, of what we would call whole brain people that really are able to full-time manage and equally uh, lean on the right and the left side of their brain. But what we see overperforming organizations do is that they build teams of equals, bringing those two together. And this is where the humanized um, uh, growth part also comes in. And I think this is also in the, in the IRG program, Greg, we've, you know, we've, we've run with the Da Vinci profile and we'll get a little deeper into it in a minute. Um, but we've run with it and, and, and we said there's, there's actually a need for a renaissance of the marketing role because you describe it very well. Um, where perhaps uh, 10, 15 years ago, marketers were in the doghouse because they were seen as spenders, uh, perhaps even wasters of company funds, uh, not knowing what part of their spend was effective. Uh, they've course corrected and probably maybe thrown the baby out with the bathwater on understanding all the data, doing perhaps even more digitally than they should because they can measure it, even if that's not what we should be doing. And, 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 and with that has gone, perhaps the thing that really makes marketing unique in an organization. No one else in a leadership team will bring this to the table. Indeed, that unlocking the humanized aspect, you know, unlocking data with human insights. If we don't understand what's actually driving the motivations for the behaviors that we're measuring, we're seeing performance uh, marketing companies that are world-class run out of ideas. Human insights is, are also the, the human creativity brings or unleashes the magic of the technology. We, we can do almost everything now, but how are we going to apply that technology? It's human creativity that brings that together. So that whole brain is um, so, so important. And, uh, and in that the, the Da Vinci growth profile, uh, we really talk about how those both are important. Um, what do you think if you look at that profile, I mean, let, let, you know, and we'll get into what the profile looks like in a minute, but if people become more rounded, will that also then perhaps pave the way to your uh, earlier ambition for becoming a CEO more yeah. often? You know, it's a, it's a great, it's, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. One of the things I worry about with the senior most group of marketers is that they perhaps didn't have some of the rounding experience and other functions early on. So the message I would throw out to younger emerging stars that want to do more is go round yourself out early on. It's difficult to get a, a, round, a foundation and a rotation through finance when you're too senior. So try to, you know, sharpen that sword now. The great news about all of this is that, you know, can you imagine being a marketer where you didn't really have access to all the consumer touch points in the journey? Mm. The good news is I'm seeing the evolution of the CMO plus job where having customer service as an opportunity, as an example, should be part of it. And can you imagine the gold that is gleaned from those service agencies that are engaging with customers about what they do or don't like about the product? Can you imagine not having access to the e-commerce website about uh, what people are looking at and how and why? And, and that's why I think we're seeing these CMO jobs, the big ones that are, are this isn't a land grab, but they're getting, ex they're becoming expanded roles and touching every part of the customer journey. Uh, I, I think it's, it bodes well for the breadth of responsibilities that these people are going to have. The last point I would make, and I would lift up near the top of your list on DaVinci is this notion of being a, a collaborator, uh, mm -hmm. having trusted relationships with your peers and being a servant leader. I can't think of anything more important, but if you don't have a trusted relationship where you're collaborating and you care not who is getting credit, um, you know, that needs to be at the forefront. And when I just sit on the ringside seat and watch what's going on, it's those marketers that don't really care that have those trusted relationships where the CFO's got my back and, uh, I'm trusting, you know, the head of supply chain so that her team is doing what she needs to do. I mean, that's what we need. And, and it's not always going to be rosy, but you need to work really hard to have those trusted collaborative relationships. Well, you know, it's um, credit to McKinsey, um, who did a piece of research uh, very early on this year, um, which directly correlated the effectiveness of a CMO to the number of productive collaborative relationships with EXCO members. And there is a correlation literally 
The most important uh, collaboration, uh, obviously, is the one with your boss, the CEO. And we talk a lot about alignment of expectations. Um, and, you know, we, um, Kim um, uh, has, has, has written in HBR in the same time that you did around um, the, the key reasons why CMOs fail. And the number one reason is that lack of alignment and expectations. Uh, but the number of relationships with other EXCO members correlates directly uh, with effectiveness and, and, and tenure. Um, I, I want to explain to our listeners a little bit um, more about that Da Vinci um, profile. It's available on the Institute for Real Growth uh, website. And uh, as of a few weeks from now, uh, you'll actually be able to um, benchmark yourself as some of the um, Institute for Real Growth leadership program participants are doing uh, against that profile. So if you're interested in that, uh, we will reach out in, in, in probably about two weeks. It's in development now for a broader use. And, uh, and we'll invite you to, uh, to profile yourself against the uh, Da Vinci um, Growth CMO profile. But I wanted to say a little bit more about what it looks like. Um, as a basis, and, and we work with uh, Greg very closely on this, but also with all the people that are part of Greg's global uh, marketing and CMO practice worldwide, over 20 colleagues from, um, from China uh, to Hong Kong to uh, India, uh, Europe, uh, multiple countries, uh, and, and, and here in the, the Americas, um, really uh, sort of siphoning out what those key, what we call experiences and attitudes are. Now, in the past, people have talked about skills and competencies, and um, we actually chose very consciously for those two descriptors because skills are what ultimately the CMO, uh, the CEO brings you in for. There's a job to be done in this role. And uh, I think you said that when you look at the profile, you're almost tired. Uh, and I think that the realization is that no one does all of these things well. But I think your conversation with the CEO is about now, what do you need in this company over the next few years? So the, 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 the focusing in on what experiences do we need this person to bring to bear? is one, but the other is the attitudes. And, you know, we, we can't help you suddenly develop uh, experiences, but attitudes uh, manifest through behaviors. And so in the real um, growth leadership program, we actually work with the CMOs and other growth leaders to the, understand what the behaviors are that manifest the attitudes. And you mentioned a few, servant leadership, collaborative, um, uh, but, but also curiosity, because surely it's the marketer that is the window on the world for the company. Um, I, 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 when you look at a profile like this, can you, can you talk a little bit about how you use that in the process of developing um, a search, uh, Greg? Well, typically, so when we do the environmental that I mentioned a moment ago, when we go to visit a new client, uh, if done right, we get a chance to sit down with the head of supply chain, head of ops, head of finance. And it's interesting and perhaps a loaded question when I ask the question, what do you want to see from your marketing partner that you're not seeing today? Mm. You know, be careful how much time you have because these people have views, they've got a well-informed perspective and they're, it matters greatly. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time working on is this notion behind a book that one of my partners, Jim Citrin, wrote called You're in Charge, Now What? And it's the idea of how do you build momentum early on? And spending time with the peer group versus thinking about doing the marketing really is at the top of the list of things you need to do at the beginning. Uh, the fact is, if you don't have trusted relationships with those people, you're not going to know what's going on. Uh, just because the CFO thinks the marketing team needs to do something, I'm not encouraging you to, to race to the other side of the room on that dimension, but to make sure it's your job to make sure that they understand what you're up against. Uh, the great CMOs right now are asking their colleagues, what can I do to help? Um, so they're bringing that empathy, sympathetic to what, you know, I've, right now supply chains and operations are, are grinding and the marketer needs to be somebody that will be somebody that's... And HR. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions around the, you know, remember the audience that we're, that, that's listening in and, and viewing in at the moment is mostly CMO level. And so 
you know, they can't go back and go broad discipline. They either have or they haven't in the past. But as you think about their role post COVID and just sort of longer career, you know, these are ambitious leaders. Many of them feel that the company, that they bring what the company needs and, and probably have that CEO ambition. Um, you know, what's important to them? What should they be doing? What should they be asking their colleagues? Well, one, one quick uh, logical, I'm seeing a bunch of these questions pop up. One's like, what's the, what's COVID mean for each of us? And I'll tell you one thing that's kind of a fun new story. Um, we just recently completed the, it's now public, the public CEO search for eBay. Yeah. And the search was done entirely virtually. And if you peel back the cover on that, it's not unusual for me to be interviewing you, Mark, or others by a video in a format like this. I've been doing it for many, many years as my colleagues around the world do. Uh, it's quite another step change to think about a chairman of the board, uh, the rest on the nomination committee, to not shake hands, not have dinner, not meet somebody in person. And you would expect a fabulous you know, e-commerce company like eBay to be an early mover on that. I think it's exciting. And what it, what it matters for each of us that are on the call now is, is how are you gonna perform, articulate yourself, and how are you gonna show up in a post-COVID world, which means working from home? And whether you're interviewing for a CMO job or whether you're trying to engage your peers or your teams, uh, some of the silly stuff matters on how you show up at home and how you think about it. And, and one thing for, and I'm seeing some of these questions pop up, some, one thing that you may not think about if you're interviewing for a job, wouldn't it make sense for you to help the recruiter or the client pull together, how do my prior experiences match up versus what you need? What's mm -hmm. the justification and the examples of the work in the rearview mirror that I've done that may help you? You know, don't fall victim to a bad recruiter's questions. And I love it when I have a, a appropriately aggressive candidate either before the interview or after the interview to say, hey, Greg, we didn't cover everything. I thought it might be useful if I give you my perspective on how I stack up versus the client's needs. And here's some examples of my work. Um, you know, that's just, just smart business. And I think it's a great thing to do. You know, the reality is winning is really, really hard. Uh, and my colleagues and I around the world are looking for people that have historically put the ball in the hoop repeatedly. And so you need to demonstrate that track record of success. And I would encourage people to think about what would your peers say about you on this particular dimension? You know, are you authentic? Are you sympathetic? Do people follow you even in tough times? You know, we have the good fortune of serving some of the world's greatest clients and they're looking for these kinds of things. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm watching my CEO who's not on, I'm sure, getting Ben Williams. Uh, the way Ben Williams has stepped up in front of our firm during this period is great leadership. It's like what I saw Arnie Sorensen do from Marriott. I, yes, I encourage yes. you to look at his YouTube video. Absolutely. Uh, it was authentic. It was heartfelt. I think I saw a tear or two during it. Uh, sure. That's a company that's going through a massive change. And I applaud Arnie for stepping up and delivering that kind of message. And what I'd encourage each of us to think about is what would our colleagues say about us and the way that we're showing up in this difficult time for all of us? Well, well Greg, I, I mean, uh, those are um, th th those are profound words, I think. Uh, as I reflect, uh, it's interesting. I mentioned my daughter um, earlier in the conversation. Uh, as I see how my kids have gone to this uh, working at home, and, and, and I'm, I'm closing off here now, I see that some kids have taken to it really well and others less so. She has really jumped on this as a new way to actually do well at school. And um, we are in a pivot point, whether you like it or not. And I think everyone that is in a leadership role has an opportunity to step back and say, how am I gonna re-engage in this new post-COVID world. And no one will argue that the whole concept of recognizing all stakeholders, the humanized aspect of our growth strategy, the fact that our colleagues are so important, the fact that our role as an organization in our community is so transparent, and the fact that what our customers, as you mentioned on that journey, at all the different points want and, and, and have as their ambitions and motivations. Uh, that leading to the capital markets uh, need for results, but absolutely revised needs for results. 
offers a lot of people an opportunity to step back and say, how do I want to show up? And, and what role am I going to play to help the company bring all those thoughts together? So I think, um, I think you really helped uh, pull some of those strings together, Greg, from a, a, a personal, a leadership and a, a CMO perspective. And I, um, I, 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 I really want to thank you for that. Yeah, it's pretty, I appreciate it. One, one last thought. A wise African once said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go as a team. And I can't think of a time where that's ever been more important or more true. And uh, it's a pleasure. I see there's, I've got, it looks like many friends that are throwing out questions. I would love to circle back with those to, uh, to chat and answer questions, post this. But Mark, thanks for the opportunity today. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Well, uh, Greg, again, thank you big time. And to everyone uh, that's uh, listening to uh, us at the moment, I'd like to invite you to next week's session, same time, same place. And uh, it will be my colleague, Frank van den Driest, uh, having a conversation with Pratik Zhu, the uh, CEO of WPP China, where, uh, of course, we have a market that is far earlier or later, if you like, uh, ahead of us on uh, the development uh, phase here and actually being able to address not only the tactical, but also the strategic aspects of, of humanized growth. And then in the weeks to come, we have Antonio Lucio, Miguel Fabricio, um, uh, with Jody Harris from uh, ABI and Kraft Heinz. You mentioned uh, um, Paul Pullman and Keith Reed, in fact, is also joining us. So uh, a lot ahead of us. Uh, come to the Institute for Real Growth uh, website for more information. Uh, we will be recording this session uh, every time and then make it available for sharing among your colleagues. To everyone that's listened, uh, for everyone that's asked questions and helped shape the conversation, I want to say a big thank you and a special big thank you uh, to my colleague and friend and co-collaborator at Spencer Stewart, Greg Welsh. Thank you, Greg. My pleasure. Thank you. Great, great to be with you. Talk soon. Bye -bye. Take care, everybody.